Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here in the Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. It's good to have you all with us. Many of you listen to our series, The Rise of the Right, and we're going to take it on the road soon. Our first stop will be Texas. And today we have a conversation with Texas activist and writer David Griscom, joining us from Austin, the capital of Texas, where he co-hosts the podcast Left Reckoning. He recently wrote a fascinating article that was in Jacobin magazine entitled, When Cowboys Fought Private Property. It's the story of the fence-cutting wars of the 1880s that in some ways led to the building of the progressive movement in Texas. And David Griscom, welcome. Good to have you with us. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Fence-cutting wars. I mean, this is, mm-hmm. so we're not talking about a John Wayne movie here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it would make a really great film, it I would make a, say. It I would, mean, it would, it would, it would. Well, go ahead. <laughs> Tell us. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was a, it's a really fascinating uh, story, and uh, I guess we can get into it in a little bit, but, you know, it's, it's a story I had sort of heard a few times. Um, you know, I'm from Texas. I'm a bit of a Texas history a nerd. And, you know, every time you come across this story, the way it's always told is this is how law and order came to the state of Texas, right? Because it's a it's an important moment of the Texas Rangers sort of putting down, you know, the wild um, folks in, in this state. Um, but if you really look uh, closely at it, it's a really incredible um, interracial movement against private property. Um, and it was not one of those things, you know, a lot of times when us, when progressives find an interesting story from the 1800s, it's a very isolated event, right? Still interesting, but isolated. This engulfed the entire state. Um, and all across the state of Texas, the vast majority of counties had active fence cutting uh, wars. Um, so it's a really, really important moment in, in the state in the state's history. And I think it's something that is sort of underdeveloped and uncovered. Um, but just briefly to sort of sketch it out for folks, what happens? So after the Civil War, um, you have a lot, you know, the state of Texas, like many other southern states, were economically devastated. So you have this huge land grab by wealthy folks, some people of the old planter class, but also an influx of northern and European capital coming to the state of Texas to take advantage of the cheap land. They start buying up tremendous amounts of land across the state, and it just so happened that this was occurring at the same time of this new invention called barbed wire. Um, you know, and barbed wire as a Texan, you know, it's very ubiquitous. It's a part of, you know, growing up, getting your jeans cut on it or something like that someday. Um, but rather than it being something that people embraced, people fought against it because what barbed wire represented to them uh, was the end of what was called the open range, the idea that the land sort of belonged to everybody. And you had these big, you know, land barons coming to the state and also established Texas ranchers buying up more and more land and then putting up barbed wire all around it. And they did this with such enthusiasm. They weren't just covering up their land. They were covering over public roads, public waterways um, all across the state of Texas. So you see this kind of just physical impediment to life in the state. Literally, it was difficult to go from county to county, even if you were just traveling. Uh, but certainly for people who made their living off of the land, uh, particularly like landless cowboys, um, this became you know a huge impediment to their life. So at first, people started cutting down the barbed wire solely out of necessity. Like, I got to get you know my cattle over here. There's barbed wire in the middle. We're going to cut it. Um, but it very quickly became this vigilante movement. And all across the state, large groups of people started organizing themselves into different gangs um, to cut down these uh, the, these fences. Of course, it being Texas, um, the landowners you know soon hired a bunch of uh, goons with guns to shoot at the fence cutters, and the fence cutters armed themselves too. Um, and that's the the fence cutting wars began in earnest. Um, and there were multiple incidents of you know shooting fights and things like that happening across uh, the state of Texas. I, I love some of the names that you of the uh, fence cutting gangs. Uh, names like the Owls, the Javelinas, the Blue Devils, the and the the, the Knights of the Nippers. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, it's a fascinating thing if you read into it, um, the, the nippers in particular, which are, you know, the implements they were using to cut down these these fences, it became like a badge of honor. So you could go into a bar or a saloon in, in the state of Texas and people would sort of proudly wear them on their hip, <laughs> the you know, to indicate that they were with this this rebellion, which is really cool. So, I mean, it, it also has this kind of complexity. I want to talk a bit about that. I mean, these, I mean, it, it's something that, you know, you don't read about much these Texas fence cutting wars, but but let's talk for a minute just about where Texas was then, the post Civil War, the kind of contradictions of race and racism. Um, there's this one quote you have in there. I'm sure it was very mixed, and in, in terms of some people allied with 
with uh, with uh, Chicanos and Mexican Americans and and black folks who were freed, and some people despised it. You have this l- line here that says some of the fence cutters in post Reconstruction who hated the progressive policies of Reconstruction. The quote is down with monopolies. They can't exist in Texas, and especially in Coleman County. Away with your foreign capitalists. The range and soil of Texas belong to the heroes of the South. No monopolies, and don't tax the schools, and don't tax us to school the ends. Give us homes as God intended, and not gates to churches and towns and schools, and above all, give us water for our stock. So, I mean, the contradictions were there. To talk a bit about mm-hmm. that and what you learned in terms of 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 how where unity existed, but also where racism kind of divided and in many ways helped kill the movement. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, you know, so this is sort of one of the classic uh, stories about any of these kind of labor uprisings in the South is how effective racism was at sort of breaking them. Um, and certainly it was uh, present in the, the fence cutting wars. It was also something that unfortunately was a player in the Texas socialist movement, right, which has a very interesting and, and larger tradition than I think a lot of people expect. But you even had socialists who say, you know, we're not going to touch that, right? Um, because if we start talking about racism and things like that, you know, we're going to get axed. Well, didn't matter because the state destroyed the socialist movement pretty early on anyway. Um, But no, I mean, like this was uh, when it comes to like this progressive movement. I mean, I think there's two factors at play here. One is, as I noted in the piece, um, you know, the fence cutting wars was a like a a true kind of grassroots reaction to a problem. Um, But it wasn't orchestrated by any kind of political movement, Um, which one meant that, uh, you know, you had people sort of, you know, just acting on their own in their small groups. Uh, But it also allowed newspaper men. Um, and people sort of unaffiliated directly with the movement to be able to, um, you know, carry on whatever, you know, things that they wanted in with it. Like that quote right there came from a newspaper man who's like talking about, you know, the problems that the fence cutters were facing and then sort of slides in at the end um, <laughs> his frustration with the funding of schools for, uh, for, for black folk in the state of Texas. You know, so this is, I think, you know, part of it is uh, one to reckon with and realize um, the, the the nasty history in, in, in the state here, but also to recognize, you know, some of the problems when you do have a movement like that if you don't have um, a political wing or the kind of organization that will be necessary to you know push forward your message and things like that anybody um, can try and own it um, you know, and, and the fence cutting wars is, is interesting because it was one that was, you know, directly in people's economic necessity. And I think that that's why it was, um, you know, there was that kind of interracial component. It's very different from like something in um, a, a later time, but like the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, yeah. uh, which was a massive unit uh, union of, of tenant farmers that had interracial like organizing as a plank. The, the fence cutting didn't have anything like that. Um, but what the fence cutters had was because it was such a direct threat to Tejanos, uh, to black folk, to uh, poor whites, um, that, you know, it, it became interracial just because of the economic necessity. And, you know, one of the tragedies, I think, of the fence cutting wars um, was that, um, you know, it, it wasn't able to sort of harness itself into a larger political movement. Now, people in it ended up joining movements after. Um, but this upsurge that we saw, you know, was sort of scattered. Um, very quickly. Well, I'm going to talk a bit about what what, what that meant, but I want to take a slight digression with what you just said. So you, you mentioned the tenant the tenant farmers, mm-hmm. and I know they were big in Mississippi and Alabama. Were they also big in Texas? Um, there was there was a um, so the the Southern Tenant Farmers Union. I mean, where it was hot as was in Arkansas. Right. Um, there right, were right. there were there there were big parts of uh, the, the Tenant Farmers Union in Texas um, as well as in Oklahoma. Um, so they played a role, never as as hot and as big as they were in uh, in Arkansas. But I also think that that comes down to the tenant farming system in Texas not being as developed as it was right. uh, in Arkansas. But, you know, all these folks, I mean, you know, you, you know, this is a whole other conversation. I'd love I, I, to, I didn't to really talk about one day. When you said that, I had no, to No, no, I mean, I'm, I'm working on a piece right now on the tenant farmers that's going to hopefully come out jacked very soon. Oh, cool. So, you know, prime for it. Um, but a lot of Texans, you know, come from these kind of populist and agri- agrarian movements in Texas and end up being leaders in, uh, in, in Arkansas as well. So these are all connected, these fights. But uh, now the way you, the, the article, I mean, I, I really, was not you sent me down a rabbit hole with your article <laughs> <laughs> so i started kind of unearthing stuff from other stories I, but the, so that but the texas this these fence cutting wars were intense and they were violent and mm-hmm. and they, they, they literally were a war between people trying to open the range saying you can't cut the range off from us we need the water we need to be able to graze our cattle and take care of our livestock as well so i mean so it, it, it was a, it was really kind of a a fundamental class struggle Mm-hmm. that took place 
where the where the as we used to call them the Booker C won in the end. But but talk a bit about that. I mean, how the intensity of what that moment was. Oh, I mean, you know. <laughs> Let's start with the the hypocrisy first, okay, right? Fine. Um, because you know the hypocrisy of of this entire movement is that you have this you know uh, class of of landowners and big ranchers who are you know saying this is my land, you know you guys get the public lands. Well, all the while um, the big ranchers they were still using the open range, so they were putting their cattle up into the open range into the public lands, eating up all the grass, drinking the water, and then once the grass was depleted, then they sort of retreat into their enclaves, right? So there was a direct unfair fairness um, to this from, from the get-go. Um, but yeah, I mean, this became, you know, something that was a huge, uh, you know, economic uh, push for people because what ended up happening was, uh, you know, all of this, you know, finance capital in particular ends up investing heavily in, in, into Texas at this time, particularly into landowning and into the cattle market. And you see this huge explosion in the price of, of cattle at this time. Uh, I, I noted in the article that in just three years, um, the price of cattle per head went from $7 a head to $25 a head. So a big reason that this becomes so violent is because the capitalists, the people who invested so much money into buying up all this land in Texas, investing in the cattle industry, wanted to make sure that they could get as much from their returns as possible. And having any kind of competition, even if it's from sort of unorganized small farmers, was an impediment to them. So, you know, there, there's an aspect to this that is like the enclosure of the, of the public lands, um, but it's also an attempt to try to monopolize the market, right? To only have the big players being able to sell cattle in San Antonio and Austin and in Fort Worth. Um, so this, you know, becomes a real kind of life and death fight for these kind of small, um, you know, the, the these, you know, some of the some of the fence cutters were small property owners, right? Um, who owned very small tract of lands. A lot of them were landless workers. Um, but you know, regardless of what their actual position is, they're nothing compared to these big cattle right. barons. Um, so this became something that was able to unite people who might have been able to have a moderate homestead or something like that against these incredibly powerful players um, in the state. So how did it? I mean, you 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 write about how the, the this kind of led to other movements being built, um, mm -hmm. the Farmers Alliance, the People's Party, the Texas Socialist Party. The idea that Texas had a Socialist Party, I love. So I, I, went, I went down that rabbit hole too. Um, <laughs> um, but so, so, so you said many of the fence cutters ended up joining these movements. Um, mm -hmm. So talk a bit about that. And, I'm, I'm, and let me just stop there. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so, I mean, basically, um, this is a kind of common experience across, like, the South and the Midwest at this time, is you see these kind of explosions around one issue. Um, farmers Alliance is another example of that, right, where small-time farmers were getting screwed over uh, by the, the national financial system, um, by the shopkeepers, and they realized, oh, if we get together, we can maybe um, fight back and push back against these kind of things. A lot of these people who get involved in the fence-cutting wars, you know, they their their life, their life gets interrupt, in, interrupted by politics, right? Their life gets interrupted by this mass enclosure that's happening. So people start to build connections. They start to get to know each other. They start to maybe read newspapers and things like that that are not just talking about, you know, the fence cutting wars, but all of these, you know, wild ideas like socialism or populism, things like that. Um, so, you know, so you have a lot of these community links that are being built, right? These kind of class rooted um, identities of people realizing that, you know what, we're not all Texans, right? I'm a, I'm a worker. I'm a small landowner. I'm a farmer. I'm a, I'm a small farmer. I'm a cowboy or something like that. Well, that is something that is in direct opposition to the money powers that are governing in Austin. Um, that is something that is in direct opposition to the big land baron, um, you know, a couple miles down the road from you. Um, you know, so it was something that really built a lot of class consciousness um, with people. And um, you see this massive upsurge in, in the populist movement in Texas um, at the end of the 19th century. Um, and they were able to have some successes, uh, get some people elected, made a big impact on, on politics, not even just by, you know, maybe getting an election here or there, but just because, you know, people had to react um, to the demands of, of these people because they were organizing into a political force. That's why the state worked so hard to put them down. That's why they made such an example out of these fence cutters in this example. Um, and out of that, you know, going to the 20th century, people sort of went through the experience of, of, of populism um, and started organizing with the Texas Socialist Party um, because they saw how populism, um, as effective as it was in some degree, um, was able to be incorporated into, particularly into the Democratic Party in the state of Texas. Um, 
And that became like a big kind of political threat um, and a lesson that people took. And they started joining up, you know, the Socialist Party. And yeah, I mean, the Socialist Party was very influential in Texas. Um, you know, Eugene Debs was a regular visitor here. Um, you know, there, there's a really incredible history of, of the Socialist Party in Texas. And, you know, part of it comes out of these agrarian revolts. Um, another part of it comes out of the, the fact that a lot of people who came to Texas were these um, German socialists right. um, who came here to sort of build out communes. You know, they immediately were thrown again. They might have had this idea that they were going to go out into the wild and build a nice little community. Well, sooner or later, politics started coming to their doorstep. Right. Sooner or later, they had to engage in the, in the state or at least the national political scene. Um you know, so there's the, these kind of twin movements of like this German and immigrant population that's coming to Texas that's holding these socialist ideas and these kind of agrarian populist movements that are, you know, pushing up against the limits of that kind of organizing and maybe looking for something bigger. Yeah, well, you sent me down that rabbit hole too. And I started reading about... <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it, I, I love it. I started reading about Comfort Texas. Yes. Which is where these, not the, the 48ers, the folks who fought in the communist revolutions in Germany, ended up coming here and creating a whole world in, it was also an anti, it was also an abolitionist world mm -hmm. in Texas. Yes. And, you know, for, for listeners, they might be surprised to know that uh, um, there was a young journalist at the time named Karl Marx, um, who also what, what tried to what immigrate who, who? to Karl Marx. <laughs> <laughs> He tried to immigrate to Texas, uh, but was end up being blocked um, when he was trying to leave Prussia at the time. But that's a story for another day. No, I mean these uh, these these Germans, particularly in central Texas, in central Texas and in Comfort Texas, you know, tried to build out these kind of socialist um, systems. And you know, for political theory nerds, I mean, these were more utopian socialists in the sense of their idea of how to make political change was not so much like we're going to seize power, um, but we're going to create a great model, right? We're going to sort of get right. ourselves out of society, get some land, and we're going to be able to build like a utopian system. And, you know, very impressive things that they, they did. And these people lived and died for their ideals. So Comfort, Texas, um, you know, and it's a tragedy given the name of the town, um, was the site of a very brutal massacre of, uh, of, of, of these German Texan socialists uh, by the Confederacy. So after Texas um, seceded and joined the, the Confederate States of America, um, the, the army of the Confederate um, the, the, the Confederate States of America went around town to town and demanded people um, sign up and pledge loyalty to the Confederacy. Uh, these Germans refused. And what's really interesting about this story is that for a long time, um, it, the, the story has sort of gone that they were murdered. Um, and they were they were all killed off, and they were. It was a site of a massacre. Um, but recently, in the past twenty years, more and more archaeological evidence has come out that is starting to point um, to the idea that they probably fought back against all odds. And they um, so they you know they they end up being massacred. But these people went out fighting against um, a cruel system like slavery, um, fighting against the Confederacy, um, and dying right here in, in Central Texas. You know, and uh, I'll just say this is like as a Texan, um, you know, these stories are really important for us, I think, to, to uncover, um, because it's just as much a part of, of our history as anything else. Um, and Texas has a really brutal history, obviously, like most places in this country. Um, and I think it's a testament to, you know, our ancestors and, and, and these folks to be able to remember their, their story that like for every one of these horrific chapters that you hear in the history of Texas, know that there were these incredible people who are fighting back against it. Oftentimes they lose, but it's, you know, our duty, in my opinion, to hold up that legacy and, and, and to, you know, sort of fight for it for their memory today when i read about comfort and we'll, and we'll conclude after this but when i read about the comfort it made me think of it as another alamo <laughs> yeah. you know and yeah truly yeah, an alamo for different texas i, I love that you know? idea. <laughs> <laughs> what does those all have to say to us today i mean mm. i mean you're a writer but you're also an activist in texas today so what are these stories what does this history say to where texas is now and what lessons to learn and where do you think that takes us to understand this in, in the context of what we face today, what you face today in Texas? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say, you know, up top, I wish we would have more fence cutting, uh, looking at what's happening at our southern border going on right now. That's an interesting um, idea. 
it's it, you know it's our history right uh-huh. um you know but i mean what what are these lessons i mean look there's a lot of things that we can pull from the fence cutting war is that you know you were able to unite uh, people against all odds of, of different backgrounds at a time you know when society was trying to pit groups against each other um you know fairly well based on you know coming together across these these shared interests i think the fence cutting wars is an inspiring one but i think it's it's limited in comparison to maybe the things that we saw in the socialist movement or in the populist movement um but you know some i mean there, so there's like there's a lot of organizational lessons that if you really want to dive into these things are, are are you know can be really helpful right looking at what are people experiencing in their day-to-day life that is the thing that is preventing them from being able to live a better life right so if you're somebody working in the state of texas right now i mean what is a force that is on your back well right now the state government has been actively working to uh, ban water breaks uh for workers mm-hmm. um in a state that regularly gets over uh, you know 100 degrees that's insane uh, which is unbelievable. And, you know, if it were only that, they're also, that, that the way they've written that law, the way that movement is sort of set up is to effectively bar local governments from being able to pass any sort of regulations for workers, right? So that's something that like you can feel in your everyday. If you're somebody who works outside, if you're somebody who works in the state, you can see who's lining up on the other side of you. You know, think about the same thing, rising rents, um, cost of living in the state of Texas, right? You can see who's benefiting from that. Well, the speculators and the real estate industry and the state government here that's protecting them. Like, I think that this is one of the big lessons that we have to take from the populist movement, from the socialist movement, from the fence cutters is, you know, we can talk about capitalism as like an abstract system, right? And that's what great. Don't get me wrong. Um, but if you can really root these things in people's everyday lives where like that connection, instead of it being sort of this, you know, spiritual force, right? A lot of times people love to talk about capitalism as this like spiritual thing, you know, um, and, you know, but instead actually rooting it in people's day to day issues. I think that that has tremendous um, possibilities for people to organize. And the other thing I have to say is that, um, you know, one thing that I think a lot of Southerners do and a lot of Texans do on the left is they sort of like issue, um, I don't know, their, their Texanness, right? And I'm not talking about doing some like flag hugging, tailing of the right thing. I'm talking about, you know, being some, like, I, I, I'm, I'm from this place. I love this place. I, I'm a socialist. I'm, a, I'm on the left because I believe in the people here. Um, and being able to be well-versed in the history, in these movements, I think is really important for us so that when we say, hey, we're for these things like higher wages for workers and unions and basic democratic rights. These aren't some like foreign importation, right? Or something coming from California, New York. This is literally what people were fighting for in this state um, seven generations ago, right? This is as much a part of the state's politics and the state's history as anything else. Um, And I think being able to be rooted in these things are things that are really important for us to be able to be confident um, in, in doing going forward. Well, I said, it's been a pleasure to talk to you about this. And I, I look forward to many more conversations. And we're going to link to this article in Jacobin, When Cowboys Fought Private Property. Uh, you should definitely check it out. Um, it's, it's an important piece of history that links to where we are in this country at this moment and what's happening in our world today. And David Griscom, thanks so much. I really look forward to talking more to you and seeing you in Texas soon. Sounds good. Looking forward to it too, friend. <laughs> and uh, so, so thank you all for joining us today. And I want to, um, and please check this out. Check the story out. It's a really great article. Link to other stuff he's been writing. Uh, and uh, I want to thank to our crew here, Adam Coley, Cameron Grandino, Keller Rovar, behind the scenes, and everyone at Real News for making this possible. Let me know what you think about this, what you'd like us to cover, your own thoughts about Texas. I want to hear them. Write to me at mss at therealnews.com, and I'll get right back to you. And by the way, before you roll, while you're here, go to realnews.com, force our support, become a monthly donor. So for Cameron Grandino, Keller Rivera, and the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.